actually part of one of the teams that were just in the uh, with the level in um, uh, some of the 63 levels. And then later that year, I joined the state of the state of development program as an old draft and led the team developing the first 1902 free executive. This led on to the uh, development of uh, other executives test software. So we grew to a, what we call a software division, rather than a of 100 people. Um, and then later I was, uh, was, well, I was in charge of the mine in Manchester and uh, Steve Lich, uh, of software, which was in charge. And it was a program in 2003, and I had a certain amount of involvement in many things. So I was involved in the range at some point or other, quite a long time. Um, next. Um, the executive was at the heart of the 1900 series. It activated and controlled other elements. It and the hardware combined to provide a range of compatibility in a way um, across many different hardware implementations and different operating systems. In fact, in a way never done before, nor actually quite that long since, I believe. This both enabled different hardware software trade offs to be made on different systems and it meant that a program written to run on one operating system at the lower end of the range would run completely unchanged on a totally different operating system at the other end. Um, and with some exceptions, compatibility worked uh, the other way around. The executive was not just one program. There were, in fact, numerous types of executive over the life of the range. And these executives were largely different software implementations with different operating system characteristics. I recall a dozen such as Steve Lee alone prior to 2003, and the total must probably double that. And then these executives ranged from the very small through to what the powerful operating system in their own right. Sorry. Executive controls the amount of programming and the peripherals, handling all real time aspects. And Charlie's explained the program already. So, executive and start program, sign peripherals to the program's requested, accept a program peripheral command, translate the program's logical number to a physical one, give the appropriate commands for that particular peripheral's hardware to start it running, and that would happen usually in parallel with the program continuing. When the program uh, couldn't continue, so, again, for example, needed data from transfer, executive was suspended and started our priority one, switching back to the transfer was successfully completed. The executive looked after error recovery to end where possible. The executive also provided the file system on most system magnetic data systems. Back in most versions, the executive was a freestanding operating system in its own right, able to control all of the system other than programs by itself. In the upper middle of the range, it was supplemented by George 1 and George, or George 2, and all the interactive systems, Minimal and Maximal, which ran on the program's, programs under it. George 1 provided the job control, control the program sequencing, and George 2 entered IOS fully. At the top of the range, George 3 provided the operating system features, including the file store, and George 3 executive quite unlike those in the rest of the range, so the slaves controlling the peripherals for hardware time sensitive aspects of multi program. Lower down the range, there was no room for a separate George, and indeed eventually such things as job control and schooling were built into some of the executives. Thus, paradoxically, the executives for the uh, larger machines were much smaller and less visible to the users than they were on many systems lower into the range. In fact, executives were thus the operating the operating system for many 1900s, including the smaller systems, and probably numerically and better deep numerically the part of the 1900s ran just under an executive than under a George. Also, even on some larger systems, users with a simple work, they might prefer to work freestanding executive plus George 2 rather than George 3, or the transaction processing with a, a transaction processing monitor running on top of the executive. George 3, of course, provided um, far more sophisticated facilities and was essential for any large user population, particularly the big bomb. And counting all the end users of large George systems, probably were, wouldn't like to say whether there were more end users of George systems or more end users of freestanding executives. But executive did have this independent role as well as uh, being confident in supplementing the operating systems. Executive role in providing compatibility was key, as has been said, and it provided the common application interface across the operating systems, except on George Street systems, where this was done by a combination of George Street and executive. It insulated the other software, including George Street, from the quirks of specific hardware implementations, whether of processes or peripherals. Now, this was unlike the IBM 360, where the order code, the hardware order code, was the same interface with the same across the range, but the interfaces of different operating systems varied. Um, on 1900, the hardware under the basic construction set could be but different. But the interface to software above executive was kept the same, and hence a program running on one system would run without any change on, on another. And this was unlike other ranges, where changes, for example, to the peripheral driving instruction were needed to go from one's regime to another. In fact, executive could be considered to be effectively part of the hardware. Um, and it's noteworthy that it was managed as such, with the executive team being part of the hardware development groups rather than the software one. 
The, this meant that the hardware and software designers could work together to make trade-offs differently at different points of range. And those, these trade-offs would change as cost parameters changed and as technology advanced. And incidentally, we even used the power of change control to see these changes to executive slide. The origin of the 1900 executives, the FP6000 one, developed by Ian Sharp's team in Toronto. I recall that when I went on that trip uh, as part of the Devil's team. Uh, as a key feature. This version was small, I think it was only 1,024 words, and its purpose was to provide a protective multi programming environment for controller peripherals. However, many of the key features, such as controller data and limits and sub programming, were present in this clever piece of software. The peripheral set was at this stage very limited with relatively simple drivers. This was developed in Manchester to be the original executive of the 1904 5, but before that was completed, key events occurred which gave executive an even more fundamental role. Previous speakers have explained how the idea of the 1900 range came about. The need to provide a replacement to the department poplar in very short order, uh, I, as I recall it, uh, uh, required a machine on which the existing 1904 could run with really virtually no change, it really was essential. And to keep the hardware cost down, several of the more complex functions would be implemented in software. And it was decided to incorporate those into an executive with a small machine with an appropriate entry mechanism similar to the extra codes used for driving peripherals. Those were called extra extra codes. And when I say more complex functions, I mean such as multiplication and division. Hardware is more expensive in those days. Uh, Plenty points will say later. I wrote the extra extra codes myself, and I recall poring over the 1904 logic diagram to achieve the same result. <laughs> Eventually, these software routines innovated exactly the 1904 hardware, even in out of range error conditions. And I remember the inner loop of my division routine with its misuse of characters, the most diabolical four lines of code I've ever written. <laughs> the, the, this machine in 1902-03 was not required to provide multi programming, it had some simplification. And in other ways, the hardware was made cheaper and done more to an executive. However, an identical application interface for executive for peripherals was implemented on both 1902 and 1904, but which more or not. The first 1904 and 02 executive were produced in parallel with the hardware and were demonstrated at the BE in October 64. Developing the 1902 version done from scratch and debugging it in two months from the first sight of its hardware was a frenetic activity. We were very proud of the use of real, not just a demo system, even with a tape library for program loading, loading which we added in the last minute. Thus, the 1902 and 04 system, uh, executives were, uh, system, sorry, were uh, compatible not in hardware, but the interface for the combined hardware and executive component presented to the applications and higher level software. I just re emphasized what's been said many times before. This was the, uh, a unique and key aspect of the 1900 compatibility. <coughs> The key factor in retaining and subsequently maintaining this compatibility was the 1900 Compatibility <coughs> Committee. The committee formed out of some ad hoc meetings at the end of our summer of 1764. Bruce Patterson was in charge of software planning as chair, Tony Hetherington representing software interests, John Bell, John Thompson, and Mike Davis were the first representatives from Manchester, and Colin Taylor and I, those from Stevenage. I'm very glad to see several of those here today. Others, of course, played the key roles, maybe then later, and my apologies for those I haven't mentioned. The body formed itself spontaneously. It wasn't called into being by some manager tech. And of course, the commitment of its members came from the heart without there being any feeling of imposition uh, or unnecessary constraint on technical design as a result. In fact, our management saw what was going on and were very happy to let it happen. Why is it they're not interfering in any heavy handed way? And uh, in due course, gave us a formal point to report into. A key early success of this body was a decision to change the peripheral driving instructions from those of the FP6000, the ones from executive, from the sorry, application executive, to a much more flexible and extensive set under a new Perry instruction. And I think much credit goes to the Manchester team and the software writers under Teddy Hetherington for agreeing to this. It meant extra work at this point. And in many other circumstances, it's not invented here. Syndrome has prevented it happening. 
The Command Ability Committee continued with this fight for the life of the 1900 series. And the importance of the, the compatibility required the same interface as provided for George III too. So the then chief programmer of that team, Henry Wood, who I see is here also today, joined it too. George III provided, of course, other facilities. Uh, as well as, as I'm sure George Gotham will describe it, but it always supported these primary executive interfaces as well. The, the Compatibility Committee grew and developed subgroups, and it was, but it was a very effective mechanism for those involved, albeit it had some downsides and some frustration for those who were outside the campaign. Overall, it was an extraordinary success, and the compatibility achieved was really very good. I recall that when the 1A and uh, the 1901A and 1902A systems were introduced, Peter Hunt set up a long program of tests to prove that these programs really, these systems really were compatible. And this program was actually abandoned after a few weeks, but unnecessary. A remarkable achievement. Together. Um, as the range developed, new features were added, which could only economically be implemented on larger systems. We found one or two tricks for dealing with this, like a range of which executive would give a zero response to any extra code it didn't understand. So it would invent new uh, uses for unassigned codes. And the software just had to check the zero to see if the response was a real response or just then not available on the system. And so again, it didn't have to implement the feature on all across the range of ones too. There were a couple of other major changes to establish interface as well as in the very early paragraph, and I shan't go into these not time today. I've actually included this a few other points in a, in a rather an extended version of my paper. Um, but by and large, support compatibility was maintained. So this compatibility was achieved by this cooperative effort between the teams of Manchester and Stevenage and the George team, all under separate management and different divisions. The cooperation between hardware and software designers in effect in creating what are in effect joint designs, coupled with this democratic cooperation between the software team and the compatibility committee, for a remarkable episode in the history of the computer industry. There was an interesting blend of rivalry and cooperation between the executive teams of Manchester and Stevenage. Um, Mike Forrest has already referred to the uh, good results of having um, friendly, friendly enemies, as it were, cooperating, people who cooperate, uh, but nevertheless, who are rivals. I can give a lot of examples of this. Uh, there's not time today, and I've documented some of the extended, this extended version of my paper. One aspect was that when a new program was added to the range, we could have different ideas on precisely how it could be controlled. But whichever the team who first was going to implement the program would decide how they wanted to do it, bring that design to the compatibility committee. The other team could comment and raise any objection, but then they would accept the interface, whatever they thought of it. When they came to implement that peripheral driver, if, it came, if that peripheral came to their system, they would do it compatibly. <coughs> Discs, I recall, were originally steam and drums and multi card file originally in Manchester. The rivalry was, in fact, very constructive, as was the equivalent between the hardware teams. The teams themselves were fairly democratic and worked well with complementary skills. We did produce some remarkably bug free software for most of the time. Early on, all steam executives had to be generated onto cards or paper tape individually for each site. We had no fashion paper. So to repair it, we'd have to do a complete reissue. We got away without disaster on this for a really surprising week of time. The development of George III on 967 was a big job, and like most of our operating systems, it took some time to achieve maturity. And as has been said before, the fact that even the largest machines could run under their freestanding executive provided some short of this as customers could use their machines for commercial work while trying out early versions of George III. Incidentally, there was initially a firewall between George Street and his executive, so George put a corrupt executive. Once it was complete and reliable, that was removed and replaced by a more intimate interface to improve performance in about 1970. Much could be said about the many different variants of executives that developed as the range of extended, but there's obviously time for only a few points today. I've documented a bit more. One point is that the performance and size of the executive were important considerations. Obviously, the performance overhead for 
driving peripherals and other time principle activities had to be kept low. And I recall cutting instructions to the region of 10, 50 or so. Uh, we wrote quite tight code. Uh, but as it warmed, the store occupancy, even more on the small systems where executive could take a significant percentage of the available store. Executive sizing was an art form, including leaving space for enhancements so as not to take more store away from existing applications. Uh, note that all early executives were wholly men's store or core residents. Also, another aspect was that the specific executive of a particular machine was tailored to its configuration to include just the peripheral drives and tables that that configuration needed. It was generated from the master for that executive type. And I was earlier talking about different types of executive, I was talking about different types. With the arrival of this, it became possible to overlay an executive. Single and multi program overlay executives with due course developed for Steve Beach and multi program in Manchester. And this allowed other features to be added inside executives, such as job control and smoothing. So we developed in 67 68 complete new executives at both Stevenage and Manchester. At Stevenage, we were rather ambitious and have been very successful recently, so we went over more. We're very sophisticated, as I know, better than store allocation and form of pseudo paging in our multi programming overlay executive. Eventually, this paid off in 2003. It made this possible, but it caused us all a lot of misery on the way. Whereas, in contrast, and this is part of the team rivalries and learning from each other. At Manchester, there have been some recent difficulties on the executives, and Charlie Ball, who had just taken over the team, insisted on it using safe programming techniques. And as a result, produced a, a, an executive which was a lot more reliable to start with. George Van S, uh, to complete the slide, was the single program overlay executive job control facilities, including the equivalent to George Van, incorporated in Cycle. And we also extended the master program the overlay executive to incorporate George Van to the features including smoothing using our dynamic overlay mechanism. The next big computer development of Steam was 2903, which was developed in parallel with the early 2900 systems as we described before. Uh, it was conceived as a 1A replacement, but had a bit microprocessor, and rather practical to explain more about this. Uh, that allowed us to add other facilities like direct data exchange, entry, and transaction processing. And a new generating system was developed to support the microcode. That technology was then used to provide the basis, basis for direct machine emulation systems on the 2900s by the team under Colin Taylor. These enabled 2900 to be run as 1900 systems, including running the 1900 operating executive, system executives. I'm sorry, operating systems, that is, George Dependence executives. And were of great importance for ICL and its customers, allowing customers to continue with their live workloads while developing 2900 equivalents, and while the ambitious BMV operating system was brought to maturity. So that the 1900 2903 philosophy of executive microcodes served to provide ICL with another vital support for its revenue stream in the mid 70s. The last system, the last system in the series was the ME29 developed in 78 and 79, which was given a new operating system, TME, the transaction processing environment, which had the facilities of previous systems put together with additional communication and transaction processing, and again, the support of the 1900 compatible interface. So through two decades, the 1900 series was developed with unique compatibility supported by um, many executive operating systems. And there was a smooth transition of customer applications and other ICL software. Both as new machines, new technology developed, and as customers outgrew their existing systems, traded up range of satellite systems, or any satellite systems. It was achieved by teams where hardware and software expertise was for the critical period of common management with cooperation between divisions where rivals were healthy and not destructive. Those with long memories may recall the title of the TV series that followed up and that was the week that was. And I remember we had pinned up a wall and steam with executive, not so much a program, more a way of life. So it was.
to talk about the uh, primary about the hardware of the system, so I'd like to try and do a quick tour through the 1900 range in chronological order. Uh, Julio said that he wanted some visual material, since I always do exactly what the Julio tells me, as is well known. Uh, I've in fact produced quite a number of slides of uh, various bits of machine and technology and so on, which I'll try to disperse into the talk at the appropriate moments. Um, I've got quite a lot of material. Uh, and Arthur will prompt me if I'm running late, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. Uh, and in particular, when we get to the slides, I should just flip through those, just so those, those of you who can handle the machines just uh, are uh, hopefully reminded of them. Um, <coughs> lots of this material, as I think has been said earlier, um, we, when we look for records of some of these things, we don't find the records. Uh, so a lot of this material is actually reconstructed from the memories of the people who put it together. And I think we would be very grateful for adding your memories to that. So if you have things to contribute to say that's wrong, it should have been there or there, please tell us afterwards because it will help to improve the sense of knowledge. I should say my credentials that uh, follow on from Michael's remarks, I was in fact one of the team that came from EMI with Norman Brown. Um, I worked at Stevenage um, on the smaller 1900s, <coughs> until it's been with Judge and I went to Manchester where I've been since. I have it in the slide of Manchester accent. Yeah. So, talk about press and technology. Um, I want to try and define the, word, the, the use of the word technology fairly broadly. Um, some points have already been made that um, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting achievements associated with the 1900 range, and indeed what much that ICT and ICL have done, is the achievement which, which uh, was produced by really quite small teams of people against um, the competition, particularly IBM, which was, as already been said, spending more on R&D than, than ICT actually had in terms of total revenue. So I wish to just remind ourselves that when we talk about technology, we're not talking about the things we see over there, the hardware bits, talking about the processes that went on behind those, the design processes to enable the uh, design engineers to actually design the machine in the first place, and talking about the manufacturing processes that allow the factories to determine that's in Now, um, to, I'm going to use the roadmap which Virgilio put up um, Julia points out it's a fairly complicated roadmap. Um, basically, I've tried to colour in the different, different series of machines so you can follow the lines of each um, type of machine, each model number of machine. Uh, across the top of the roadmap, designated the various different series of machines that occurred. And I shall go through the different series of machines. So I should keep referring back to this so that you've got a little bit of orientation about what we are. So, first, we're starting off with what I call here the original machines, the ones that were announced um, in the first wave announcements and uh, which were exhibited in the first year of the, the first uh, exhibition of the and the second exhibition of the 91K. Okay. So the machines in that bunch comprise the original ones, which are 1902, 3, 1905, in fact 1909, which is not shown on that slide because it, if I'd drawn it, it would exactly overlaid that, that would be even more confusing. Uh, and then a little later, the 1901 and the 1967. So for that group of machines, technology. Um, now, as been said earlier, the, the important thing here was um, that we were trying to expand from the original FP6000, which was a single point design, uh, to a position where we had we could expand that to cover a range of machines. But the important thing was trying to market. We wanted to get in this, get that market slot uh, before IBM started shipping to the 60s. Um, so trying to market is very important. Now, in choosing the technology, as been said earlier, um, the, the choice was very much to go for a proven technology, one that was well understood, one that was supported. Uh, so the technology was the technology of 700 series packages. There's, a couple, there's three examples over there. I've got some slides to show you in a moment. Um, the capture, the design aids, capture of the logic is all done in <coughs> um, the, the Those things were connected together by uh, backplane wiring, which were used a form of uh, what's called Pokemon wiring. I'll show you a picture of that, not really pictures, but some pictures of that. Um, 
the computer wire, the wiring lists for those were actually generated by computer from uh, manual inputs. And then there was a bit of automation in the factory to actually help the production of those backplanes. Um, there was a, a jig made such that an operator would sit on one side and the machine would actually tell the operator to connect this to this, and the operator would make that connection with a wire that was pre-cut to the right length. And sitting on the other side of the machine, another operator would insert two test cards, which would then test that the link had been made between the right two places. So there's, there's a level of kind of uh, semi-automatic operation in the factory. So if I <coughs> hopefully the my mixed my multimedia technology will now work. And uh, <laughs> okay, here we've got just the 700 series packages. Uh, that is the one you can see over there. This is the, um, I suppose, the, the archetypal 700 series package, the 701, which is just six gates. Um, the technology was essentially similar to the technology we used in FB6000, but it was just slightly emphasized. Uh, my colleagues in circuit design told me that uh, it was um, the transistors were changed from, the sets of the transistors were changed from germanium transistors to silicon transistors. So that was the basic package, and there were variants on that. Um, this is a slightly more complicated one, with 12 gates on it. Uh, and again, a more complicated one still, which actually, I'm not cheating here, this actually comes from the next range of machines, but you can see that there was some development during the period. Basically, the technology was exactly the same, it was fairly simple printed circuit boards, uh, but they, they did become denser as time went by. <coughs> Uh, not a good picture, I'm afraid. I took this under rather difficult circumstances. This is a machine, this is actually a 1905E, and this bit of the machine is actually screwed to a corridor in the University of Manchester. It's the only one I can find. <laughs> um, but I think you can just about see on here the, what looks like a rat's nest of wiring. In fact, these wires cut to length, different colored wires, different lengths. The operator selects the wire the right length, plug it in with that plane. That's how the wiring is made. A very quick way of wiring. And with the constant check machine, the rack will work in water. Next. Okay, so those, that's the technology. And now what do we make out of that? Then the first series of machines, um, I've just lumped together, I've lumped in the 1901 and 1967. So we started off with the 1904, which was essentially the FB6000. The left hand side of the slide is the, essentially the commercial machines, the right hand side is essentially the scientific machines. Scientific machines by and large, the larger machines uh, were all an odd numbered version of the commercial machine and in all cases they were made by adding a, a, an extra uh, piece of logic on to provide floating point arithmetic. On the top end of the machine it's called floating point unit, on the bottom end it was called extended mathematical unit like the 1902 and 3, in that case, rather than calling them different numbered machines, they just had this feature. So those are the scientific machines derived out of the commercial machines. Um, to go from the FP6000, we went upwards into the 1906, which is essentially a new design, a new implementation of the FP6000 architecture. Uh, it had more experts, more logic inside it, capable of operating more quickly, taking less instruction, less internal instructions to actually perform a 1900 instruction, therefore went quicker. And there were two versions of that actually, one of which had a quicker store in it, and gave uh, sort of 30% of increase in performance. So that was going upwards, going downwards from the 1904, as Brian Minister always said, where he said we did some simplifications. We left out some of the more some of the more expensive instructions, things like um, uh, the move instructions and multiply division. <coughs> Those are provided by the extra X codes that Brian spoke about, so the program level is still all compatible. Um, and that would produce the 1903. 1902 was exactly the same as 1903, but fitted with a slower store, a six microsecond store, which is cheaper. <coughs> uh, and then uh, subsequently, a year, year later, we get to the 1901, we did get a further simplification on it. Um, and in particular, we went to a much um, reduced size in terms of data routes. The machine had a kind of serial parallel it. it actually processed one at a time. If it had to process the whole world, it had four, four goes of doing it. So those are those machines. And um, again, with a bit of luck, um, 
I'm uncertain about this one. Uh, I'm not sure it's a four, five, or a six, seven, but it's one or other of those. Um, if anybody recognizes it, perhaps they can tell me. Uh, this is oh, here's another one. That's probably a four, I guess, in fact, it's got three ways in it. <coughs> uh, this is a 1923 um, with the console top right from the foreground. And this is a 1901. The 1901 installation uh, actually taken in a room, this is a sort of what happened steamage. Um, the south side steamage was then unoccupied. It had been used for photographs just prior to the to it being exhibited a lot of the, during the period of the business uh, exhibition. We'll see some peripherals in there, and I'll show you some more peripherals in a moment. Okay. Uh, this is a 1901. It's not really my first talk about peripherals, but, but Michael's already mentioned at the beginning. Clearly, they're a very important part of being able to offer a wide range. We've had to have a, we have a comprehensive range of peripherals. Um, lots of already been said about standing face, so I won't put on that. Um, but the common peripheral range, and Michael already, I think, mentioned the inflating peripherals that were there originally for the first announcement, and those subsequently added to. Um, these types of peripherals were, were available from the beginning. Rather interestingly, on that list, no extendable disc part, no extendable disc on. Although I have a sugar picture, which I took from a brochure, a book rather, that was produced for the 1964 Business Efficiency Exhibition, which shows a picture of extendable disc part, this disc drive. And I would be very grateful if somebody could throw some light on it. So just to have a quick whiz through those peripherals to remind people what they look like. Oh, sorry, no, I've got a, I'm out of step with my multimedia presentation, of course. These were some installations of the machine. So this is a, uh, I think, a 1905. This possibly is a 1905 at Southampton University. Next. Uh, this is a large 67 in Ooh, Ministry of Social Security. That's it, that's it, that was it, that was it, that was it. yes. <laughs> The other configurations. So now we go on to the peripherals, just please. Anyone? Carberry. Just the last Carberry? Yes. 1920 card punch. What's this one? I'm not sure what that is. The other card. Carberry, do you think, is it? Right. Famous line printer that goes on for years and years. Wonderful line printer, 1933. 1916 paper tape. Now here's another one. On the back of this, on the back of this photograph, it says 1916. Does anybody recognise that? Yeah. It's right, is it? Wonderful. I've never seen one of those. <laughs> I was really baffled when I saw that. Okay, next please. 1971 tape system. Uh, 2501 cassette tape system on 1901. A continuous loop of tape. Four cassettes plugged on the top there. Continuous loop of tape in them. A sort of pseudo random access device. Data, uh, I think data products. Data products. Fix this store. Um, they have one of these at the University of Manchester. There it is. There's one of the discs that spun very fast, as in the Bryant, which people were very worried it was going to shatter as it went round. And uh, you can see the size of it. And this thing here is the head actuator. <laughs> if you looked inside your PC, you know there's a little bit smaller in the <laughs> MCF? 
the other point I must say over here uh, is that um, it's on. Yep. Um, <clears throat> if I go on from that, so that was the, the, the store, that, that store logic like used in the 1904 series. When we moved on to the A series, we were now using integrated circuits and actually the practicality of making a store like that. When you did that, you got to the cost, the cost came out of the world, it actually cheaper than integrated circuits. However, in this, at this time, integrated circuits had no storage capability, no large scale storage capability, they just didn't exist in the integrated circuit available there. So these machines all went back to this hardware form of control logic. And it wasn't until we got on to 2903 and then MA29 that integrated circuits had progressed to the point where we could actually build regular stores. And now with one big advantage, these stores, whereas that one was a fixed store that was the pattern was put into at the time it was manufactured, these were actually loadable stores. And what we did there was to allow uh, us the capability to blur the distinction between what was executive and what was in the basic control of the machine. So we could use that in 2903 and then in 2009 to execute uh, quite complex operations very quickly. So things like the direct data entry capability in 2903 would not have been possible had it not been for that writable <laughs> store. Now we've gone on to the to the A series. Um, set of machines introduced around 68, spreading out some time now. Uh, full set of across the big range. And these were architecturally, they they used all the architecture which had been which had been um, uh, which is now robust and which had been proven in the earlier machines. But what happened, the big thing that happened here was that these machines Whereas the earlier machines had used technology very conservatively because they wished to get to market quickly, these machines were very aggressive in their technology. They used leading edge, the leading edge technology. And this actually gave them a key competitive advantage. It helped them to move them up uh, against the competitive machines and helped to prolong their life. So these are very important machines. In, in many ways, these are very much the central machines of the night and like the flower of the night and range. To flowery language. So, looking at that integrated circuit technology, it was a complete new technology um, using integrated circuits because of the speed and size of it, rethinking the entire packaging. So, the packaging, we needed new automation tools to go with it, was both design it. Uh, manufacturing had to make a huge investment in manufacturing capability in order to manufacture the much more complex printed circuit boards, and in particular, that, the things like that 1906A platter, which made us. Uh, so there was an enormous step up in manufacturing capability. There were two different approaches used. Um, well, let me, let me jump on. There were two different circuit families used. The 1901A to 1904A used TTL technology. That was just becoming available. Uh, it was much faster technology than integrated circuits, which had been available before. Um, but um, it, uh, it, was, it was much quicker than it was, and as I said, we, we were very early using it. In fact, there was work in Stevenage on a machine in 1966, I think, which used really some very, very early uh, TTL surface and text instruments. The metal work was actually a joint, it was really very much a collaboration between Motorola and um, Manchester. Um, the people in Manchester realised there was a different way of using the metal circuits to the way Motorola had been previously used. And there was a collaboration formed in the that, which really took Mechel forward, which took Mechel forward, and which effectively gave rise, or at least one of the things that gave rise to the Motorola Mechel 10K series, which is actually still available today. So those are the different circuit families. Those two circuit families were then, um, they then finished up by, by sitting on two really different technologies, top to bottom. So the TTL1 sat on these things called macros. That's so you put a lot of circuits on one printed circuit board and interconnect them on the printed circuit board. So you're now using, now using tracking on the board to replace that, that bird's nest of wiring that we saw before, or at least to replace a lot of it. Um, the 1906A technology um, required the use of uh, the connections had to look like transmission lines. Uh, and that had very small, the, the actual integrated service amount of a small board, which credit side board, card side board, which you'll see there, uh, which also had the matching resistors on it. And then all the interconnection was done through the platter. That meant it's a multi layer platter, it's a 12 layer platter. Very, really quite a huge step forward in manufacturing terms 
from where that wouldn't happen before. Okay. So big, big jumps in technology. Um, yes, I've got some quick questions on that. Here's uh, the here's a macro board. You can see, you just about to see, multiple integrated circuits on it. You can see there's quite a lot of interconnection on there. Still fairly simple interconnection, quite thick tracks. Um, but now we've got these things you see here, which are actually wires, which go through and connect tracks on one side and board tracks on the other side. Seven hundred series budget, the earlier budget didn't have those. Um, so that's the TTL macros. Uh, this is the 1906A platter, that's that platter you see there. You can see the little boards. There's the, the plug-in platter. And when a 1906, this is a 1906, this is Hina's, the 1906A, when it's assembled. Here's a, here is a platter. These are all assembled in columns. Each of these platter consumes so much power. There's a separate power supply for each and every platter in the machine. Uh, and that, of course, meant there's a lot of heat space. And heat, of course, is engineering heat out of machines. It's one of the big things that has to be done. Huge blowers and bottom heat will be all cool. Uh, that's another view of the same thing. So what are the, machine, what are the machines like? We've got our technology. Um, on the, um, the 6A and 4A, uh, had this paging feature which we talked about earlier as an option. And um, partly in support of that, there was a new version of the 1900 interface called High Speed Mode introduced, enabling them to drive very fast drums so you can page back the course of the drum. And that was available on those machines initially. Then on the TTL machines, there was a 4A, um, 2A, and 3A, which were again just different by having different stores, um, but also for well, by different stores and also by a certain amount of different uh, internal timing. And the 1901 a which now, a new departure on 1A was that it actually had an integrated, some of the peripherals started getting integrated, so there was, a, there was a, the printer was integrated with the main processor cabinet. And there was also some new disks introduced for the 1901 a So we get some pictures. Um, this is a 1901 a I'm sorry about the photograph, somebody's obviously used it as a publicity but it's quite interesting because it's a 1A, and the 1A is uh, what the front of the A series announced occurred just about to move over from, from ICT to ICL. It actually says ICT on it, not ICL. This is the 1A in Putney Bridge House installation. Uh, this is the 3A, and those are all the pictures I managed to find of the A series. Don't worry. So we then went on to the S and T series, and I've run out of time, so I won't, I won't dwell on those. I'll simply say the S series was a whole series of enhancements on the A series, um, giving faster, faster capability, spanning the size of the configurations. And the S series was essentially the last series which went all the way across the whole 1900 range. Then the T series, and the T series, by the, by, by the time the T series came along, the top end of the 1900 range is essentially being superseded by 2900s, but we're still selling the 1900s into the lower parts of the market. So the T-series was necessary to, increase, to, to, to bring up the competitiveness of those machines. And largely what was done there was to reduce costs by integrating things like the disk controller, using semiconductor stores, and effectively the machines have moved down the model. So what was the 1903T was actually a 1904A drag. So that's the S&T series. And then, right at the end, and actually going on much, much longer than before, so you know, taking us actually almost up to um, the, the end of the 1980s, actually, was what I call a small business machine, which are really going into a different setting, still using the 1900 architecture, but packaging it and presenting it and selling it quite differently. Uh, 2903, the first machine, very much up in a new segment, very innovative with technology, Many, many innovations in 2903. Uh, I've talked about this, I'm sure, but mine don't believe what Campbell Kelly says about it. It's not right. <laughs> uh, highly, highly innovative machine. Um, used um, some really new things like semiconductor storage. It was one of the first machines in the world to use semiconductor storage. This really was bleeding edge, because when we actually tried to make it, it didn't work. I mean, Intel didn't do it yet. <coughs> and we had terrible trouble, with it, but we got it out, and, and, and 2903 was an extremely successful machine. Uh, and lots of other innovations on it, which we've not time to talk about. 
And then every 29, we trot it off from 29 to 3 into that market, and which actually continued right up to the end of the 1980s. A couple of pictures, and I'll finish. Probably have to step. Yeah, I'm going to have to step. Let me just get through these. These are just the technology slides again. Here's 29 to 3. Um, interesting shape, amongst other things. Um, interesting, interesting, of course, the fact that it's called a 2903, which I understand was, was, was Peter's invention. Indeed, you see it's covered in hot tango. You see it's make everything as a 2900, really a 1900. Uh, but it did actually, it was actually designed as a video set at the beginning with eight bit internal working, so it could actually be turned into a 2900. I believe actually Galpies did in fact make it take one of the microprograms to look at the 2900. Well, okay, thank you. So, I'm just in conclusion. So, I believe that the nice kind of range was successful over at least two decades, uh, arguably two and a half decades. That we saw in it a combination of what were very innovative, um, very much leading edge uh, developments, and interspersed with really quite conservative. Uh, approaches. Uh, as several other people said, I believe that the, the, the success of it, many things have been to the success of it, but in, in, no, in no small part, especially due to the engineers, both hardware and software engineers, manufacturing engineers, transformation engineers, who managed to produce the complete technology and deliver the products um, with a much, much lower investment than the other competitors of week. Uh, my acknowledgements to First of all, of course, to my many ICT, ICL colleagues, and especially to the people who loan me some of the bits and pieces which I've brought down today, uh, to the National Archive for History of Computing in Manchester, uh, all the photographs you saw actually came from there, uh, and to the Manchester University Computer Science Department, because I actually went there and they, in fact, some of the print circuit boards actually came from there. They have a few of these machines preserved in there, and they've lent me those pieces. I've never found out who actually 
actually wrote that document. It was a phenomenal list of software on all the hardware configurations that were being announced, and also on all the different types of peripherals, which you've heard about uh, in these lectures today. Before accepting the appointment, I did in fact give it some careful consideration. And I said that I would accept it, provided a number of issues were clarified and permission obtained. First of all, I asked for permission to reissue 1024 with more appropriate delivery dates. Secondly, I asked for adequate resources to be provided in, the term, in terms of competent, experienced programmers and also in terms of computer hardware facilities under my own control on which we would do nothing more than develop the software which we were producing. I also asked that I reported directly to Arthur Humphreys himself so that if I had any problems, I could hopefully get them sorted out quickly. These conditions were in fact accepted and I therefore started work. First of all, we rewrote 1024 with more realistic and appropriate information. The rewriting was not in itself a very complicated task, but the effect on the sales force who had been selling the equipment against this promised software was in fact rather dramatic. And I spent the first period of my time giving in meetings with the senior executives sales force and in giving lectures to the junior members of the sales force, guaranteeing to them that we'll, there will be no further slippage on these dates during the life of the project. Secondly, it was agreed that as far as people were concerned, uh, we could recruit 100 programmers, additional programmers, immediately, which is what we set about doing. And thirdly, it was agreed that we would have under our own control in Bridge House, in Putney, uh, under the control of what we then call Programming Division, uh, hardware adequate for our software development, which would consist of one model of each range being produced and at least one peripheral of every type that was being promised by the sales force. We organized ourselves into a number of divisions uh, responsible for various aspects of the software we were going to produce. There was the Operating System Division under George Felton. Uh, George will be talking to you later on today about the work of that division. There are a number of people here today from that division. Uh, George will be uh, telling you who they are. We had another division which uh, looked after the compilers, the scientific and commercial compilers under Dennis Pearson. And I know that Ted Humby's here today, who is responsible for the cobalt compilers. We had a general purpose software division for plan, for the work on plan, for housekeeping packages, and so on. We had an applications programming division, which was for complete applications programs that had been promised in the document 1024, for a variety of industries and an aid to sales. And lastly, we had a services division which was responsible for supplying the four production divisions with machine time, quality assurance, and also looked after the process of the issue of software. As regards the way in which uh, we were organized, uh, there were these five divisions, so there were five divisional managers, and every Monday morning at nine o'clock, we all had a meeting, which included myself, uh, to discuss what had gone on the week before and to discuss what was going on in the future and in order to deal with any urgent priorities. As regards methodology for actually producing the software, software engineering at this stage was really non-existent. It, or if it was in existence, it was in its infancy. The divisional managers themselves were allowed to decide how each of the projects that they were responsible for should be organized. Uh, there was no BS standard to which they had to work. And in particular, they themselves were responsible for monitoring progress against the promised delivery dates. 
in fact, PERT was one of the applications packages that we were, in fact, producing for running on the 1900 series. Having set up the divisions and agreed what they should do, then they got on and did it themselves, apart from reporting on uh, every Monday morning at 9 o'clock. But one of the aspects of the work that really worried us because none of us have had any experience of dealing with this amount of software that there was going to be being distributed to this amount of uh, customer all over the world. One of the aspects of the work which worried us was the problem that would ensue when we started to issue this software to all of these customers and they started to find these errors or bugs in the system. Um, <clears throat> the originating programmers in the various productions divisions would have tested the software to the best of their ability. But we always knew that however well they tested it, there would still be certain bugs which would still inevitably be present. And we wanted to reduce these to a minimum just for our own reputation and convenience. <coughs> we therefore set up a primitive quality assurance group. It was the task of this group to take the software packages from the production divisions once they, once they had to, decided that this software was ready for release and using only the documentation which was available to the customers, which had actually been produced by some other division in ICM, I had no responsibility for manuals or user guides, <coughs> taking just that documentation and the software packages issued by the producing divisions, used the package in the same way that the customer would <coughs> they inevitably found errors which were referred back to the production divisions who corrected the errors and referred it back to Quality Assurance Group. And this iteration process went on and it was only when the Quality Assurance Group signed off the package that the package was in fact released to customers. <coughs>
really do have to remember that this is 30 years ago and we were in fact breaking new ground. The sales force for one didn't like us sending out notices to everybody to say that there were errors in the software. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, time went on and it wasn't long um, before there were more models of the 1900 being produced, as, as you've seen in what you've heard today. And all of those required more software or software to be adapted to, to operate on those particular peripherals or machines. And what's more, more software was being requested by the sales force in order to deal with the competition. They were uh, the cold face about they're trying to sell these things, and they had competition. The competition was promising other things, and we had to promise them as well. Furthermore, the existing software on the 1900, by the autumn of 1968, four years after we started, was over a million words of software that we were issuing each time a customer uh, took a uh, complete software system. And the number of customers was over a thousand, and they were all located in different parts of the world. Furthermore, space to hold all of the people in the division, which had been rechristened from programming division, be called System Development Division, the space to hold this had become a premium in Putney, and also all of the computers were occupying space in Putney Bridge Size, Bridge House Size, where the sales force wanted to expand. And therefore, it was agreed that we would, in fact, move the whole division and all its computers out of Putney into the country, and we agreed that we would move them out of Bracknell where we would have a special purpose built building to house all of them. It turned out, in fact, to be an aircraft hangar, which was specially constructed to house all of the hardware, and a special purpose adjacent office block to hold and house all of the staff. Certain people initially called this building Hunt's Folly, but it consequently, I think, turned out to be one of the largest production facilities in the whole of Europe. <coughs> I was very pleased in 1968 that ICT was awarded the Queen's Award to Industry for Technical Innovation in the Production of Software. Many people have asked me what the technical innovation was, to which I usually reply when it was simply producing some software by the date, or roughly by the date, that we promised. <laughs>
Major General Peter Mitchell and the Navy in 1968. I tried very hard to persuade him not to do that. I thought it would be a good challenge for him. He said he'd think about it. And he came back to me and he said, yes, he would stay, but there was one uh, particular point he insisted upon being met, which was a seat on the main board. So I wished him luck on his departure. <laughs> <laughs>
were the first, I think, to do that. And still, even today, there are lots of systems that don't provide this. Uh, the PC uh, is an obvious one, really, although they, they have tried their best. The 360 certainly never had it. Um, we uh, came from a background of programming. We recognized that there would be plenty of mistakes, plenty of bugs, and we were determined not to allow conflicts between programs. We did a similar thing on peripherals. Uh, each program had access just to its own peripherals. Uh, this is what we call a, a sanitary design. Um, well, that's enough of that, I think. Um, OMP provided uh, multiple programs to run simultaneously, but it did not provide uh, any multi-access features. Uh, this is an idea which came later at, out of Project Mac at MIT. Um, in 1959, 12th of November, there was a press conference on Iran in West Gordon. On the 14th of January, 1960, I gave a colloquium in Cambridge University on the architecture. And I repeated this later in universities of London, Glasgow, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Oxford, and various other things. In May 1960, I described the system to the Australian Computer Conference in Sydney. Right. Uh, we, Henry Goodman, who was one of the leading people here, um, carried out a simulation actually running on Sirius to test whether our ideas of a time-sharing system were right and what changes to make. And uh, I've actually got a copy he's given me of the paper he wrote following this, which you'll find in the computer, <coughs> computer bulletin, that was September 61. In June 62, we started shift working in, a, in the West Gordon on the prototype around developing OMP, and of course with another team developing the language in Edinburgh. We actually ran some time-sharing programs on the prototype around in May 1963. I imagine this would be a, one of the world's first, and I, I can't really check that. But about the same time, the first customer of Ryan started acceptance tests to go to Turing's. Right, then there was a big upheaval, of course, with the ICT bought the forensic computer department, we all moved to Putney, and um, Peter Hunt was made responsible. And one of the first things uh, he told me was that he had a request from Chris Wilson for an operating system on the lines of OMP for the 1906 set. He needed it to sell it. And on the 1st of January, 1965, I called a meeting with Henry Goodman, <coughs> who is here, and John Fotheringham, and Henry Goldberg to discuss this requirement. And we really had very intensive activity uh, from that time on, uh, moving people about, recruiting them, running courses, reorganizing, uh, learning about the hardware, uh, and so on. And in parallel with this, we were still finishing off on Mark II. But people often ask me about the origin of the name George. Um, well, I didn't actually have anything to do with it, but while I was away, it met about May 1965, I think, I was abroad, uh, a meeting was held in my office, because I was abroad, and um, there was Henry Goodman then, Jeff Strauss, Dan Oystriker, Brian Moore, uh, and probably some others, I don't know, but those are the four main people. And um, they crashed out what would be needed to interface the operating system for the 1906 to the executive. Which bits should go here and which bits should go there. And they started with scheme A, and then proceeded, when that didn't, obviously didn't work, to scheme B, and so on, until they got to G. And then that was satisfactory. And somebody who actually won't, we can't find out who it was, suggested that G ought to stand for George. Uh, and I couldn't object, of course. But the reason was that um, it, would, it could be made to stand for General Organizational Environment. Uh, it would remind one of the autopilot on an aeroplane, which, as you may know, is always called George. And anyway, it would be a bit of a laugh. <laughs> On the 6th of July, 65, we had a meeting on what? This was multiple online programming, because, of course, Project Mac was well known then, and several of us had heard all about it uh, at conferences. But MOP at that time 
was completely separate from George. Later on, we managed to integrate them uh, into a single routine, much to the advantage of both. And um, during this stage, we designed and wrote the George Input Assembler. I think this was largely the work of Jeff Strauss and Ben Oistreicher. Um, this was uh, ideal, it turned out, for operating systems. It, used, it included facilities for conditional assembly of blocks of code, exactly what you need to put in bits of code for instrumenting the operation so that you could uh, work out what was happening when something went wrong. Um, quite invaluable. Well, in the meantime, uh, quite soon after, in fact, towards the end of that year, uh, word reached us from sales that they would like, please, some sort of cut down versions of all this for the smaller 1900s. So we, we christened George, rechristened George 3, and we invented George 1 and 2 to slip in underneath, hoping nobody would notice. Um, and some of these machines had to work in remarkably small stores. We had a 32K word minimum, but some of them had no backing store apart from tape, which was really not possible. Uh, and at one stage, there was a scheme called Minimop, which has been mentioned, which occupied 6K words of store and provided access to Fortran, Algol, and G. Um, right, now George III was perhaps the main point of interest. This was to meet Chris Wilson's original request for the 1906-1907. And this was certainly a comprehensive operating system. Covered batch work and multi-access. With the same command language for both. I think that was another world first. Uh, the 360 and had, had two totally different uh, command languages. And um, you will find uh, an account uh, of, of this by Henry Goodman in a book, APIC Studies in Data Processing, number nine, published in 1972. Um, the facilities included um, permanent file storage of a very sophisticated type, which we actually borrowed, borrowed <coughs> some of the ideas from Project Mac on that, and we used it on batch processing work as well as on multi-access work. Uh, this allowed for a large number of online users, and the, machine, the system could also handle multiple processor configurations. The prototype George 3 system was put together in January 66, and was built up eventually for issue of the very first version to customers in April 1969. This suited the larger 1900s very well, although of course initially uh, it was rather slow. And there were tremendous technical and practical problems to cope with in development. I mean, the hardware we got was very unreliable, and we didn't get access to a 1907 in Putney until August 1967. However, we managed to meet a date uh, of April 69, not quite the one that was in uh, Peter Hunt's book, I'm afraid. I'm very sorry about that, but I must plead that we weren't the only ones who underestimated the task involved in getting out a large and sophisticated operating system. I mean, almost any operating system you could mention, I'm afraid, has meant the same thing, including Windows NT, on which my youngest son has been working. <laughs> However, um, Mark V appeared, I mean, there were releases every six months roughly, until Mark V in April 1971. Mark VI was in 19, October 71, Mark VII at the end of 1972. The project then moved to Brackle, January 73, half the staff left, but Mark VIII was released in the middle of 74. And later Marks, in fact, <coughs> proved to be very efficient, reliable, and very popular with users. People keep on coming up to me and saying how much they like them. There were minor releases for some years. The last was Mark 8.67 in 1984, George Orwell's date. Um, a creation, occasional corrections were issued from time to time. The last corrections were issued in 1990. Uh, the system is still in use on DME hardware, and I'm glad to be able to announce today that we believe all the recent scare stories about what's going to happen 
to the date at the end of 1999 will not bother George Street. <laughs> um, however, there is a sting in the tail because there may be problems around the end of the year 2047. <laughs> well, I, uh, one thing I really would like to say, which hasn't always come across, although some of the speakers have been very good at it, but this work was under very high pressure, um, and some, uh, there were times when we were not really, which we weren't too happy. Uh, but I must pay tribute to all the people who worked on the, all these systems to get them working, um, even if they were a little late, uh, and to their spouses. I'm glad to say my wife is here. Uh, she put up with quite a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, we all survived. Uh, and really, it was very exciting, very exciting and stimulating time. And on the whole, I think we look back on it with pleasure. You know, you don't remember the bad bits, do you? Thank you very much. strengths we had and 
how these would complement ICT. And I said, of course, ICT haven't got the technical strength. I said, take the equipment they sell us. It's, it's a load of bloody crap, the stuff they use. <laughs> and he took all his ago to the And we got, we got to Park Lane. And but I mainly emphasized the positive things. This was just an aside. It's about, almost a joke. And when we sat around the table, and there was a sizzle mead and all sorts of very, all sorts of top brass on the board of ICT. And we were around a circular table, which I eventually was in John Bull's office. He was managing director there. It was a circular table with a central pillar that wobbled. And when you put your hand on it like that, you see. And we were sitting around, and um, there was a lot of pleasantries, and it was all very formal and very nice. And then somebody said, well, let's get down to uh, discussing this, you see. And Sebastian said, well, this is all very well. But the trouble is, your equipment's fucking useless. <laughs> <laughs> and he banged me on the shoulder and said, don't wipe me. That actually happened. And that was the end of the meeting. <laughs> We never got together. It took four years after that, after I sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
very much. It's that uh, I wanted to uh, be involved in each election because I thought having all the trauma of the 1900s, to then have to go and persuade justice that the uh, system four was very good as well. Look to be uh, a task <laughs> that whatever you said, you were going to tarnish the other one. And indeed, I remember, if I can tell this story, as David Cameron has written a book and he didn't mention this, soon after the uh, merger, he came to me and he said, we've got a problem with uh, ever ready batteries. He said, uh, they sign a, a battery tank for a system 450, but it looks as though they're not going to implement it. And so I wonder whether you come with me and we can persuade him that uh, it would be quite very wise for him to order the 450. So I said, yes, I'll come with you, David. So we're going to see this back chap. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, it doesn't sound very convincing to me. He said, uh, you now tell me I should order a 450, Mr. Humphreys, but uh, I've got many letters in my file from your Mr. Dennis Bridge that tells me that if I do that, it will be the greatest possible disservice to my company. Well, I said, Joe, well, this all happened in the early, early of the month. <laughs>
and it included two of the French Pecon people. So they got everything that we were doing, they knew exactly what we were doing. They also knew Pegasus very well, so the cross between Pegasus and Orion would be a fair description, I think. Yes. Uh, I, as a matter of aside, uh, I read a, that there's a book on how to write secure programs for the IBM 360 series, which was published some time ago. And um, there's a little a warning at the bottom of the first page that it's actually impossible to be totally secure because of a lack of this facility. Thank you very much. Mr. Zemmler, thank you. You seem to confirm between you that perhaps there was a time when ICT did have its decisive technical advantage on the software side, which was ultimately invented from the land. Yeah, I think it's fine with this and that as well. Uh, you know, one must on this of these occasions not be too negative, but um, IBM's strength was hardware, yeah. and always was. Um, in the software area, their approach was put a thousand people on it and you will achieve the objective. And we all know that a thousand people actually achieve less than a hundred when it comes to developing software. And they did not have a history uh, of good software development. And really, they were working through a marketing specification, which was really inadequate. Whereas within Ferranti, certainly, and working in conjunction with Manchester University, I think, which one should not overlook, um, ideas of this sort were being thrown around Try it out in so many machines, it wasn't true. But they were well known. Yeah. Just, just, just one point on that, though, David. I don't know whether you were here at the IBM equivalent seminar for this, but uh, and how many people here were there? But they very carefully, I thought, addressed this very point. And they addressed it by saying, when we examined our customer base and how to ensure our continuing ongoing revenue. <coughs> these are the things we need to have. And these, if I'm showing multi-programming things, we did not need and we will not have deliberately. When we need those, we'll put them in later on. But the essential thing was to preserve our customer base and the designs that they implemented did just that. That was our other. IBM certainly had a storage protection facility, which worked on lots of memory, but it was very crude and it, it wasn't going to support our software. That was circumventable. Could I make a point with my DNA? The most important thing for us in the 360 was a disk-based operating system. And disk access, index sequential files, were the things that we thought were important. And I think they were right in that judgment. Because ICL was losing disk-based systems right until the 80s, as far as I can remember. Whether it was an application that could run on this, on the whole, we won. That's, that's my view. Um, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to Mr. Kawata to you from Japan, because he's coming especially uh, to come to this uh, seminar, because he's engaged in writing uh, some history of his significance in Japanese computer activities, and now with particular reference to ICL and Fujitsu. So he's been to see one or two of us here and asking questions about the past. And I thought that he would be interested to have a little bit more uh, in this. And I hope he has. And now he has a question. Mr. Kawada from Japan. Thank
hearing uh, the story, uh, I I suppose that if, if uh, uh, I see a, I see key word an American uh, mark, they, uh, they could uh, employ some Buddhism uh, very good in uh, online real time uh, operation, but uh, you didn't uh, do that uh, according to British way of uh, doing business. And but uh, today I I have an impression that the FP6000 uh, already had the real time operation. You did that right? George? Yes, I, I think, Mr. Carmichael, you're right there. Uh, my recollection of, of the, well, I visited the Canadians several times in Toronto. Very nice bunch of people, very talented. And they did uh, have a seat reservation system for what was called Trans Canada Airlines in those days, uh, which had twin computers called Gemini. So if one broke down, you carry on with the other. Uh, they were also involved in uh, systems for uh, traffic control, chiefly in the city of Toronto, where they put in a large system. Um, and they were steeped in this real-time business. They, they used small machines for all sorts of jobs, <coughs> many of them real-time. Uh, and I believe that the FB6000 would be very suitable for real-time use. Uh, I personally have no experience of real-time operations, but I can't see why it shouldn't really work very well. Thank you, George. Yes. There's been no mention of George Four, um, which is paid for, of course. And I would like to know if it was ever used, given that I left West Gordon after designing a pager unit for 4A, and I never knew whether anybody used it. Yes, they did. Leeds University, RAF, Farmer. Is that on 6As or 4As? Only on 4As. George Ford was uh, yeah. one of the, uh, it had paged, uh, paging facilities built into it, and these were assembled when required by this conditional assembly program facility in Jin. So it was really all one piece of source code. You just pulled out the bits you wanted. It's also the case of the special compilers for the I, I seem to remember having read the Leeds University Inspectors about 1975, and they had a 6S George IV. They had a 6 George IV. So they made every statement on the four That's all that. Right. to uh, raise the question of manuals, because as a, uh, a user, uh, particularly kept uh, 5F and 5E for 10 years, University of Surrey, and um, it came as a particular uh, bucket of cold water after coming from what I think was one of the, the best uh, manuals that I've ever read, which was George Felton's Programmer's Manual for Pegasus. And the shelf full of manuals for the, the 19, 1900. And we found that, in fact, you did have to have the shelf full of manuals because uh, there had obviously been some policy decision that nothing should ever appear twice in the set of manuals. So that you couldn't make any inquiry uh, with any confidence unless you had the entire set. And uh, I gather from your remarks, perhaps you say a little more about this, that they were not written by the people who were producing the software. And this was certainly the impression that one got. They were in some very arid, uh, as if they'd been written by AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thank you.
But if you had the originating programmers producing the many apps, they would be ten times worse. Because they know too much about it to say they can't explain in simple language. They'll omit half the detail. It's a disaster. They will be a disaster. Well, mm. they're different disasters. A different Yeah. 
had a machine which would go up. We didn't simulate a floating point, that, that was really beyond, beyond <coughs> us, um, at the time, but all the basic machine tests. And so we ran a 1900 basic machine test tape into the Manchester Atlas, and you'll know, see one or two of the results there. I, I have some more material, but that is going to stay here at the Science Museum. I would promise to only sell some while ago, but I haven't had to get But I do have photocopies, if anybody wants them, um, I could reproduce them. I know Phil Brady has got a set of logic diagrams. I hope somebody will get a 4A running again somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add about the, it wasn't only BDU, um, bought from Cosa, and it was a, <coughs> a monoscope it was called. Now I can tell you more about that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had an, an extra CRT in it, which was no more than a, a set of characters in wire, which uh, it uh, scanned the character and took the, a rasp scan of that character and then correct, corrected it back onto the screen. Now I was involved in a few of those being delivered, but I didn't quite know what they were used for. Yeah. What application? Yeah. I mean, not, we had a mock system that Steve Ridge using car antenna, the type number each of those that were constantly used, you remember? Not? One of those came into the lab at my score, because we hadn't used plastic encapsulated transistors, no, they were not reliable, they wasn't properly and metally sealed. And somebody, whose name unfortunately I forget, said to me, um, do you think we can get it through quality assurance people? And, and I said, yes, but you'll have a lot of trouble. And it, he did go into the product line as a boarding product, and it was not a particularly reliable machine, but he did good duty. And it was electric, he used it on the System 4s, which is where I've seen them use it was console turbines on the System 4s. I think there are a few people here who will remember an online Rake Bush Murphy to a 1903A that was used primarily for the development of new range. Uh, and I think uh, Keith Crook may have written the first ever uh, Space Invaders program. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, I have a question. 
question concerning the uh, University of Manchester um, Regional Computer Centre. Um, I was a student in, in the mid-1970s, and there was a 1906 A there, which was connected to a CDC 7600. I believe this was a very successful venture. I wondered if anybody knew anything about the background and how that came about. The, it was a non-standard version of George Freeman. Yeah. Designed for that front end role. Well. Yeah. <coughs> there was some special software in it so that you could use the CDC as a background number cruncher, and George as the way of doing the job description and compilations and all the other stuff. Yeah. But what was the initiative behind that? Um, was it something that the university promoted? <coughs> No, I think there was a joint company uh, being proposed of multinational data or something like that between CDC and ICL. And this was a cooperative venture to try and get the two companies together. And I was actually the engineer who was sent over to Minneapolis to actually get the, there's a joint coupler between the two systems. And a small team of hardware and software people were sent over to get it working. And I think it was just a trial venture to see if the two companies could work together. There was a 7600 actually installed in West Gordon and uh, then it's moved to... Thank you very much, and can I encourage you to join the Computer Conservation Society, which really won't cost you anything.